So without further ado, I'm going to end up with the imaging of sinusitis. So what is uh, sinusitis? Sinusitis is an inflammation of the sinuses and the nasal cavity. Uh, it's diagnosed, it's a clinical diagnosis. It's based on four weeks of cloudy or colored drainage from the nose with congestion or pain in the face. It involves one out of eight adults in the U.S with about 30 million diagnoses per year, and the direct cost of imaging is, believe it or not, is $11 billion, $11 billion with the B dollars. And it's the fifth most common diagnosis responsible for antibiotic therapy. So um, I know I always you know, argue with my wife, because when I start getting uh, pretty bad sinuses, uh, I try to get her to write me a prescription, and she refuses. She's a pediatrician. So then if I call up my ENT colleagues, I'll get my prescription for a z pack or something like that. I know it's not the right thing to get, but at least it's, it takes care of things. So from, a, from an anatomy standpoint, um, you didn't go over the osteomalar unit, right? Okay, so from an anatomy standpoint, um, it, I think it's important. I think, can you, see, can you see the red pen right there? Anybody see that? Right. So um, an anatomy standpoint, <clears throat> everyone has heard about the osteomalar unit or the osteomalar complex. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go over it this. And, you know, it's late in the day. I'm getting a little tired. And sometimes I don't know what comes out of my mouth when I get tired. Joe Pernicone can tell you that sometimes. I don't know what comes out sometimes. But, you know, I'm Hindu, right? So, you know, if I'm a good person, I'll come back as somebody good. But if I'm bad, I could come back as something bad, right, if I do a bad job. And the worst thing that you can do is come back as an ant in someone's maxillary sinus. Imagine that, right? So if I'm an ant and I come back in someone's maxillary sinus, I've got to figure out how to get out of there, right? And essentially, in order to get out of the maxillary sinus, I've got to walk around and try to get out. Well, if I walk down here into the inferior portion of the maxillary sinus, this has a specific name to it. This is the alveolar recess of the maxillary sinus, and there's no way out, right? If I walk up this way, I try to get out, then I'm at another recess of the maxillary sinus, and that's the zygomatic recess of the maxillary sinus. If I walk up to the roof of this, there's no one there. In fact, once I walk to the roof of the maxillary sinus, this is now contiguous with the inferior, um, uh, the, the, uh, inferior wall of the orbit. But then if I continue walking, lo and behold, I can find a way out. And that way out is referred to as the primary ostium of the maxillary sinus. So if I'm as I now I found a pathway. So now I'm exiting through the primary ostium of the maxillary sinuses, and now I'm essentially in a cave right here, a little channel, if you will. And the name of that channel is as I'm escaping the maxillary sinus is referred to as the ethmoidal infundibulum. So when I look at this area here, this little space right here is the ethmoidal infundibulum. Now, in order for me to continue my journey on the ethmoidal infundibulum, you know, I have to walk on something, right? And what I'm walking on is this bone right here. And this bone is referred to as what? Anybody? That's the, that's the uncinate process. So the channel, the air channel that I'm trying to escape is the ethmoidal infundibulum. But the bone that I'm actually walking on, this little um, slope right here, is called the uncinate process. Now, you know, I've spent a lot of time walking in this maxillary sinus trying to get out, and I get all the way up to the top of this. I'm walking through the ethmoidal infundibulum. I'm on the uncinate process, and oh my gosh, I get to this cliff right here. And the area where my pointer is right now runs anterior to the posterior, and it's referred to as the hiatus semilunaris. So that's the hiatus semilunaris. And then I found my escape. All I have to do is jump off the uncinate process and I land in the middle meatus. So this is the middle turbinate, and this is the middle meatus. So what I've diagrammed for you is the osteomalar unit or the osteomalar complex. And it's comprised of the primary osteum of the maxillary sinus, the ethmoidal infundibulum, the uncinate process, the hiatus semilunaris, the middle meatus, and then the middle turbinate. So when someone undergoes functional endoscopic sinus surgery, this is what they're trying to open. Because what I've outlined for you by trying to escape the maxillary sinus is a normal sinus drainage of the maxillary sinus. And so when someone performs functional endoscopic sinus surgery, what the surgeons do is they go in and they resect part of the ethmoid sinuses, the middle turbinate, they take out the uncinate process, and essentially what they're doing now is expanding the opening between the medial portion of the maxillary sinus and the nasal cavity. 
to permit greater egress of all the junk that builds up into our sinuses into the nasal cavity. So that's the purpose of functional endoscopic sinus surgery. So does that, does that make sense to everyone? Okay. Good. All right, so what are the imaging recommendations? Well, first of all, radiographic imaging of the paranasal sinuses is, is unnecessary in patients who have already met clinical diagnostic criteria. And these are actually the recommendations from the AAO HNSF criteria that are, that are on the web. It's the recent, the recent updates. And imaging is indicated in patients with either potential complications of sinusitis or when considering an alternative diagnosis, just like the tumors that Doug talked about. And certainly as we have evolved, the ACR has stated that plain films of the sinuses are inaccurate and should be replaced by CT. So it's not just us th as a radiologist, this is the, the best practices now. And it's general consensus that MR is greater than CT for intracranial complications. Now one thing I just want to emphasize to the, the residents and the fellows, and I guess you know, the staff that are here too, is that di the diagnosis of sinusitis is a clinical diagnosis. And the clinical diagnosis, like I mentioned before, was based on four weeks of cloudy or colored discharge from the nose and congestion. And the reason why I emphasize that is that, you know, I decided to become a head and neck radiologist my second day of my residency. So my, the second day of my residency, I wanted to go into head and neck, right? And so I was on the neuroradiology rotation, and somebody sort of pointed out the skull base param, and I said, this is really cool. This, this is what I want to do. And it's like, you know, this is great. So the next time I was on the neuroradiology rotation, I'd already decided I wanted to go to head and neck, right? And I thought to myself, I know these sinuses, these ethmoid sinuses. So I was on the ICU rotation, neuroradiology, and I thought, you know, I'm a pretty smart guy, right? So because I know I can see the ethmoid sinuses and I see a bunch of junk in them, in all these intubated patients, I started saying, um, no evidence, no change in the ventricular size, shape, and configuration, number two findings consistent with ethmoid sinusitis in all of the patients in the ICU, right? So about two weeks into the rotation, my division chief comes up to me and says, hey, how's it going? I said, fine. She said, can I talk to you? I said, oh, he's going to say, what a great job I'm doing. I need to stop. <laughs> he comes to me, like he kind of puts his arm around me and said, hey, you know, you may want to stop saying ethmoid sinusitis. And I said, why? He said, because all the ENT residents are kind of pissed off right now because they're all getting consulted on every report in which you're saying ethmoid sinusitis. So from that point on, I learned, remember good judgment comes from experience and experience comes from bad judgment. So from that point on, I realized, you know, sinusitis is a clinical diagnosis. And really our job is to define the extent of disease. And if there is a clinical diagnosis of sinusitis, we can comment on the findings that can support that. So at the, this talk, I'll talk a little bit about cysts and polyps. We've already talked about the anatomy. I'll just reiterate that uh, later. Talk a little bit about mucosils, fungal diseases, and then we'll end with a little bit of radiation dose awareness. Now, Doug already talked a little bit about cysts versus polyps. I'll just add just a couple caveats. So the sinuses are lined by mucosa. And within the mucosa themselves are mucus retention cysts and serous retention cysts. So the true definition of a cyst is the obstruction of one of these glands. And if there's obstruction of a mucus retention, of a mucinous cyst, it's a mucus retention cyst. If there is obstruction of a serous cyst, it becomes a serous retention cyst. But the bottom line is they look all the same. So this is a CT scan. Here we can see this um, smooth margin lesion that has low attenuation. It looks fluid, and this is a, a T2-weighted MR and we can see that it contains fluid. So this is a classic cyst, not much to be taught here, right? Well, what's a polyp? A polyp is something different. A polyp is infiltration of eosinophils into the submucosal layer of the sinus mucosal lining. So whereas a cyst was an obstruction of the cyst within the mucosa itself, a polyp is infiltration in the submucosal layer. And this is typically seen in patients that have allergies, infections, aspirin intolerance, cystic fibrosis is pretty common, immodal cilia, and other vasomotor impairments. And this is what a polyp looks like. Now, we typically don't do MR, especially give contrast to evaluate for polyps. We, we usually do CTs. But this is a contrast-enhanced T1-weighted image with fat suppression 
And I can, think I can convince you with a leap of faith, this little white line here is enhancement of the mucosa. But everything below the mucosa in the submucosal layer is a polyp. So that's the true polyp. And when this is taken out, this is what it looks like. So this is all this polypoid junk that's been resected in the submucosal layer. So this is the true definition of what a polyp is. Now, from a practical standpoint, when I did my fellowship, I would uh, discuss with my old mentor. I'd say, well, you know, do I say cysts or do I say polyps? Is it a cyst or is it a polyp? And it's, there's a pendulum that goes back and forth. The way that I was taught 25 years ago, and I have not varied from this, is that I refer to this as polypoid mucosal thickening. Because some people will say, well, this sort of looks rounded, so it's, it's got to be a cyst. But in actuality, this could easily be a polyp. And Doug showed some very nice cases of, of uh, anthrocoinal polyps, and I'll show a case too. But the point is, is that just on non-contrast CT alone, the standard sinus CTs that we do, we just can't tell. So I use the term polypoid mucosal thickening, and then I'll just talk about the extent of disease. Now, I will specifically comment on the extent of disease, whether or not there's an air fluid level, whether or not there's bone erosion, um, multiple diseases, specifically, as I mentioned before, comment on the integrity of the primary osteum of the maxillary sinus. That's all in the report. But to actually try to make a histologic diagnosis without the secondary findings of bone erosion, or as we'll see, um, some of the other findings we'll talk about in some of the more uh, complex inflammatory diseases, we just stay away from that. Now, I think we can all make the diagnosis. You heard Doug talk. Here's a lesion here that's extending through the primary osteum of the maxillary sinus and extending into the nasal cavity. So this is a type of polyp. And anybody want to guess what type of polyp this is? Yeah, it's an anthrocoanal polyp. So going through the antrum of the maxillary sinus into, through the coena. So this is the anthrocoanal polyp that we, just, that we just talked about. All right, what about quote unquote sinusitis? Now, we talked already about the drainage pathway. So in the maxillary sinus, we talked about those pathways. In the sphenoid sinus, it has a pathway too. It's a sphenoethmoidal recess. But in general, when we talk about acute sinusitis, the pathogenesis of acute sinusitis arises from, and I'll just go and point this out, in the maxillary sinus, the most common area is if you have obstruction of the primary osteum of the maxillary sinus. If you have obstruction, this results in a reduction in the amount of oxygen in the maxillary sinus, and now it just starts to create this ugly stew. Because this redu reduction in the oxygen tension results in an inflammation of the sinuses, and it, unfortunately, it becomes a cauldron in which various bacteria can begin to grow. And this is the pathogenesis of acute sinusitis. And this is what we can see. So clinically, like I said before, acute sinusitis is a clinical diagnosis. So what do we say on imaging when we see something like this and when we see something like this? Well, one thing that I've learned over time um, is that this patient was performed in the coronal plane. So if you see someone performed in the coronal plane, we have to realize that this is an air fluid level. And we've evolved in that. Back in the days when, when I was growing up, we would do our sinuses in the coronal plane, so we'd have to look at that air fluid level. Remember, now oftentimes we'll do axial images and reconstruct in the coronal plane. So in that case, the air fluid level is not going to look like this. Rather, it's going to look like this. And when we do our coronal reformats, it's not going to look like a typical air fluid level. So you have to be aware in the plane in which you're imaging. And as a result, realize the fluid is going to be more dependent. So this is an air fluid level. So we can say in a patient that has clinical signs of acute sinusitis, we can see that there's an air fluid level, which is consistent with a clinical diagnosis of acute sinusitis. Similarly, on this MR, we can see this air fluid level. Now, um, I know there are some people that have talked about performing, especially with the radiation dose issues that have been brought about the last five years. It's, again, it's always a pendulum. Some people have said maybe do a very quick T2-weighted image to look for um, uh, just a quick T2 image just to look for uh, uh, air fluid levels and the extent of disease. We tend not to do that. I don't know, Doug, have you, do you do that at all? Yeah, doesn't either. So um, in general, we still are doing CT in, in order to look for those air fluid levels. Now, 
here's a, some disease here involving the frontal sinus. We can see there's complete opacification of the frontal sinus. And you know, sometimes there's um, certain areas that you have to increase your, uh, what's the right word? You have to turn up the gain. You have to be very uh, concerned about focal disease in specific areas. And, and I, I'm gonna point some of those out. And one of those is the frontal sinus. So patients with frontal sinus disease uh, do present with headaches. And typically, if you see something like this, you can say, well, okay, it's frontal sinus disease. He probably has headaches. We're done. But I will caution you that if you're not, uh, if you're not uh, uh, vigilant and that disease is not treated, you can go on to develop this type of disease. So here we see an abscess that's involving both the outer and the inner table of the frontal bone. Deeply, we can see a subperiosteal abscess and an empyema. And then in the soft tissues, we can see a little abscess right here. And this has a certain name to it. And again, for those of you that like uh, to look at the origins of names, anybody know what this is called? Yeah, this is a Potts puppy tumor. Now, I, I've got to look it up. I don't know if this is the same Potts that developed Potts disease. I think it is, isn't it? Yeah. So this, is, this in fact, is Potts puppy tumor. So when you look at this on the sagittal images, we can see this uh, abscess right here involving the soft tissues of the, of the uh, uh, scalp. And on the sagittal images, we can see this area right here. There's our subdural empyema. And then on the sagittal T1-weighted images, we can see all of this dural enhancement consistent with the severe meningitis. So this is the result of acute, frontal, uh, acute sinusitis involving the frontal sinus that's untreated. If this continues to grow on, you can develop a osteomyelitis involving the frontal bone. So this is just frank bony osteomyelitis. If it's untreated, it can go on to develop a large subdural empyema. And if you have a large subdural empyema, what is the structure that's located right here? So this is the fox, but what runs directly along the fox? It's the superior sagittal sinus. So you have to be aware of this, and if you have a patient that has subdural empyema, uh, you always have to look at the superior sagittal sinus because in this case, we can see T1 shortening right here, and this is superior sagittal sinus thrombosis. And if that is not picked up and appropriately treated, this is the MRV demonstrating the absence of flow in the superior sagittal sinus. And then on the axial images, this is a large venous infarct involving the posterior aspect of the left cerebral hemisphere. So this is a venous infarct due to superior sagittal sinus thrombosis. Well, how do you work up superior sagittal sinus thrombosis? And I think it's evolved over time. Uh, there are different opinions on this. And my own feeling is that if we have a patient that's really sick like this, we want to get them in and out of our radiology department as, as quick as we can. Um, and get the study that's going to be most diagnostically reproducible. So we tend to do a lot of CTV. So in this case, here's a CTV in a patient that has superior sagittal sinus thrombosis, and we can see absence of flow. And I know there are a lot of people that say, well, what about MRV? Why not do MRV? MRV is, is good. The, the, the benefits of doing an MRV is that you can do the diffusion-weighted imaging to look for the infarct. And I think it's certainly in, in pregnant patients, uh, MRV is, is good because you can avoid giving the contrast. But I think in general, for the average person that comes in that's not pregnant, that's not actively lactating, that's not breastfeeding, then I think doing a, a CTV is a very quick and easy study to do unless your neurologist specifically want to look at the diffusion to look for a potential venous infarct. So I think if they do have um, focal seizures that could be cortical, cortically based, then you may want to do an, an MR to look for the diffusion abnormality. But in general, I certainly like to do the, superior, uh, the CTV. And this is the example on the sagittal image. And the proper terminology for this is what? Anybody know what this is called here? Yeah, it's called the delta, it, it's called the, the delta sign. And the reason it's called the delta sign is because there's no flow involving the superior sagittal sinus and all the venous structures it's getting uh, into the vein right here. So this is actually the leaves of the dura that form the, su the superior sagittal sinus. So instead of the flow occurring within the lumen, it's redirected into the walls of the, su of the uh, superior sagittal sinus. Now what about chronic sinus disease? Well, we can make the diagnosis of chronic sinus disease 
And what we look for, obviously, is evidence of reactive hyperostosis. So on the right-hand side, normal, normal aeration of the sinuses, we can see a very, very thin bone here. But on the left-hand side, we can see diffusely thickened walls of the sinus involving both the anterior and posterior walls of the maxillary sinus. So when we can see that, we can clearly say that this is, disease is not acute, but it's chronic. And sometimes we are asked, is this acute or is it chronic? And this is the finding that tells us that this disease has been around for a while. Now, if we have really chronic disease, it can go on to form this disease entity, which is a mucosil. Now, the mucosil, by definition, is the following. It's complete obstruction of a sinus that also expands the sinus. So the mucosil is a form, if you will, of chronic sinusitis. Now, the typical mucosil is well-defined. It completely opacifies the sinus. And on MR, on the non-contrast T1-weighted images, we can see that there's high T1 signal. This is due to the protein content. Now, mucosils, if it expands the sinus, again, can be like a water balloon. But because you have all this intrinsic protein, when you look at the CT scan, it can sometimes give you a pretty ominous appearance. So this was a pathologically proven mucosil. But notice how it's eroded through the frontal sinus, and it also contains high attenuation within the process itself. So this is a mucosil. So occasionally, they can give you a bit of a, a, a confusing appearance just because of the protein content. Another example, this is a mucosil here, complete opacification of the frontal sinus. I think I can easily convince you there's an expansion of the sinus with filling, thinning of the anterior and posterior walls of the sinuses. This is another mucosil that's involving the anterior and, and, and posterior, and excuse me, the um, middle and posterior ethmoid air cells and the sphenoid sinus. This just emphasized the fact of another mucosil involved in the sphenoid sinus, and look at it on T2, it's very dark. So that's why sometimes I, I'm a little bit leery about commenting on the sinuses when I do a brain MR. Because I've seen brain MRs, when you look at the ethmoid sinuses, they look completely, um, completely aerated. But in actuality, you can come back and they're completely opacified. Because if there is chronic disease, this dephasing from the ferromagnetic accumulation of various heavy metals can give you this signal loss. So that's why I'm a little bit leery just to comment on the sinuses just uh, purely on T2 weighted images. And this was a post-traumatic mucosil. This was given to me by Bill Nemzek many years ago. This was a, a guy who was messing around um, and his wife walked in and found him with somebody else and got a pickaxe and went at his brain. So, Unfortunately, there's a bunch of traumatic mucosils. You know, fortunately, with all this frontal lobe atrophy, he didn't remember a thing. Oh, well, you guys are terrible. Okay, all right. It's just, just awful. All right. So anyway, he did develop post-traumatic. Now you're getting it. All right, yeah, okay. But he did develop these post-traumatic mucosils involving the frontal sinus. Now, one of the areas that you have to watch out for are the pyomucosils. So remember, I, I mentioned to you about there are certain areas where you have to have heightened scrutiny. And one of those areas is the frontal sinus, if it's completely opacified. But the other area is the sphenoid sinus. Because if you have a sphenoid sinus that becomes infected, realize all the structures that are located adjacent to the sphenoid sinus. So posteriorly, that sphenoid sinus is directly opposition to the prepontine cistern in the CSF. Laterally, the, uh, the uh, sphenoid sinus is directly adjacent to the cavernous sinus. So we have to be careful because in this case, this was a pyomucosil, and on the coronal images, this was a very subtle subdural empyema, and this patient ended up having cavernous sinus thrombosis, which I'll talk about in just a little while. And this is complications of sinus disease. So on the right-hand side here, here we have a normal appearance of Meckel's cave, and we can see that there's this diffuse inflammatory process that's extending into the cavernous sinus, and we can see marked narrowing of the carotid artery within the cavernous sinus. And this is all due to phlegmon. And another example here, this is an example of a cavernous carotid aneurysm in a patient that ended up having an inflammatory process that weakened the wall of the carotid artery, developing this large carotid artery aneurysm on one side, and on the opposite side, it actually occluded the carotid artery. Now, 
Like I mentioned before, good judgment comes from experience, and experience comes from bad judgment. And why do all bad things happen Friday afternoon? You ever, you ever notice that, right? So this is true. This was um, back when I was at, at U of M. I was, I was the ER. I was on the ER rotation, and we ended six. And I'd just gone through a whole bunch of studies. You know, I was getting tired, and it was literally the last case. And um, the history came in sinus disease, like our, another sinus disease, right? So have you ever dictated something and then have this feeling of impending doom? You ever, you ever done that? <laughs> and, you, know, the, you know, in the good old days when we had transcription, you know, we could dictate something and then actually think about it. And then when the report came back, we could actually, you know, be like a pathologist and, you know, think about it, look things up, and then sign it off, right? Now, <laughs> now once we give that dictation and we hit send, it's gone, right? Now, you may have a couple of minutes to hit the oops button. Do you guys have an oops button on your voice recognition? So you may be able to pull it back. But I started dictating this out, and I thought, well, here's just some, you know, there's a little bit of disease involving the sinuses here. There's not too much going on. Um, and, but something didn't smell right. And so when I went back and looked at it, I saw all of this reticulation in the retrobulbar fat. So I called up the emergency room, and I said, and there's some dilatation here involving this vein. So I called up the emergency room, and I said, is there anything going on with this patient with sinusitis? And they said, oh, yeah. I'm like, oh, great. Um, what else? And he said, it's a sixth nerve palsy. I'm like, oh, great. All right, it's sixth nerve palsy. So let me go back and look at it. Then, you know, you picked up the dilatation of the superior ophthalmic vein, the reticulation of the fat. And any time that you have a patient with sinus disease and you have a cranial nerve palsy, you've got to take a real hard look to make sure he doesn't have this disease, he or she doesn't have this disease entity. So this disease entity, um, we diagnosed based, on, in this case, in a CT venogram. So here we can see opacification of both transverse sinuses. But when we look in this area here, we see opacification of the carotid artery. But what's not opacifying here? The cavernous sinus. So this is cavernous sinus thrombosis. And this is one of those cases, I, you know, um, Back when I was, a, when I was a, a, a resident and I was going to do my fellowship, you know, I, I kept calling up the person I was going to work with, Tony, and said, hey, I want, to, I want to write a paper. I want to write a paper. And this was before the days of email and texting, right? Imagine what that would be like if there was email and texting. I'd be emailing and texting him every day. But this was when we had phones, right? So I'd call him up. And so um, he finally threw me a bone. And he said, I've got to get this guy off my case, right? So he gave me six cases of cavernous sinus thrombosis. To, to write up. And, you know, for the residents in the audience, whether you're ENT or radiology, I'm sure that, you know, sometimes you say, well, I don't want to do this research stuff. It's kind of boring. Even if it's a case report, there's nothing out of it. The one thing I'll tell you is that if you ever do write a paper, you become an expert in that subject matter. And it's amazing. That will stay with you for the rest of your life. So the thing about cavernous sinus thrombosis, it was an old saying. It says, you only see what you look for, and you only diagnose what you know. And when we looked at those six cases of cavernous sinus thrombosis, all six of those patients either died or had significant neurological deficits. And the real scary thing about it is that they were actually initially on the imaging study, but they were missed. So to think about cavernous sinus thrombosis, just remember, any time that you have a patient with cranial nerve palsy with sinus disease, you have to think of that diagnosis. And this was one of the cases at my old place, and it still kind of haunts me, but this came in in the middle of the night. And I thought, you know, you can't fault the, the residents or the ER. This is that disease involving what? An isolated disease involving the sphenoid sinus. And when you look at the brain CT, this was a kid. You typically don't have this dilatation here involving the temporal horn. And unfortunately, this child was dead 12 hours later. And I think what the kid had was probably developed an empyema and cavernous sinus thrombosis and died from this. So, you know, nothing, unfortunately, we couldn't do much. The, 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 uh, the ER wasn't expecting that, but the patient did have cranial nerve palsies. So when you see this, and especially when you see dilatation of the horns like this, you know, have a really low threshold about working these kids up. So, yeah, you may do an inappropriate imaging study, but on the other hand, you do have the problem, you, you do avoid the risk of having this type of really significant, uh, severe outcome. And this is just the bone algorithm. See all this disease involving that sphenoid sinus? So you have to be very cautious about that. Well, the next thing that I'll talk about is fungal sinusitis. And again, when we talk about the value of, of radiology in 2016, 
Um, one of the things I think we can really make a difference is to be able to educate our referring physicians on fungal sinusitis. Because when I ask our, my colleagues in internal medicine and others about fungal sinusitis, most people say, well, all fungal sinusitis is invasive disease. It's the mucormycosis, it's the invasive aspergillosis. Well, that's not necessarily the case. There's actually different types of fungal sinusitis, and we as radiologists can actually help triage those patients. So the first type is this, and this is the allergic rhinitis or the hay fever. And these findings are nonspecific. You know, it's just like we looked at before. Doug made a funny comment is that, you know, how do patients with tumors present? They present with sinus disease, right? Who has runny nose? Well, we all may have tumors, right? Yeah. It's the same thing with allergic rhinitis. You know, it's pretty ubiquitous. The symptoms are they're pretty nonspecific. So there's no imaging criteria that tell us that this is allergic rhinitis. But one point I want to make is that look at the types of bugs that can cause allergic rhinitis. It's aspergillosis and it's also mucor. But the key thing is, is that these are non-invasive types of aspergillosis and non-invasive types of mucor. But these are all types of fungal sinusitis. The second type of fungal sinusitis is a mycetoma. And again, it's typically formed by aspergillus. And in a normal host, the aspergillus is, is non-invasive and it cannot actively penetrate the membranes because it has no keratolytic properties in a normal host. So again, this is a type of fungal sinusitis, and this is what we typically see. So here's your characteristic fungus ball that's floating in a chronically diseased sinus. So here's your typical mycetoma, typically well-defined, it's high attenuation, and the high attenuation is felt to be due to some type of concentration of heavy metals, whether it's iodine or whether it's manganese or whether it's any type of heavy metal, that's what's felt to give the high attenuation within the mycetoma. The third type of fungal sinusitis is this. And this is allergic fungal sinusitis. And this is a disease that we can diagnose as a radiologist. Now, the ENT surgeons, I assume you know about this disease entity. Because this is separate from the invasive fungal sinusitis. But when you look at it, it can look pretty bad. But this is a spot diagnosis that we can make. So when you look at something like this, the key to making this diagnosis is that all three of these patients underwent a non-contrast CT. So non-contrast CT. And what we see here is a pretty aggressile disease that's involving multiple sinus, sinus, sinuses and contains high attenuation. So if you see something like this involving multiple sinuses, high attenuation, expansion of the walls, can actually extend intracranially, but we did not give contrast, there's really only one thing this can be. And this is allergic fungal sinusitis. And again, I, you know, I've never done a functional endoscopic sinus surgery, but what's been written in the literature and what my ENT colleagues tell me, it's almost like toothpaste uh, when you go in there, or peanut butter. You go in there and you slowly resect it, and it's very uh, peanut buttery consistency. And so the surgeons go in, they try to take out as much as they can, and then the patients are, are put on some type of, of low-dose steroids, if I'm correct. And they actually have a very good prognosis. And this was a case when I was at UNC many years ago. This was a 14-year-old kid that was transferred into to UNC after a renal transplant. And this was read on the outside as a rhabdomyosarcoma. So not only did the kid have a, a kidney transplant, but now they have a rhabdomyosarcoma. Well, we looked at this. No contrast was given. And we just made the diagnosis of allergic fungal sinusitis. Now, what are the other things that tell us this is not a rhabdomyosarcoma? Well, first of all, we talked about the internal attenuation. But then look at the bone. You see the bone right here? With something this big, if this was a rhabdomyosarcoma, there really should be very aggressive bone destruction. But in actuality, the bone is expanded. It looks like it's regressive remodeled. So we have involvement of multiple sinuses. There's high attenuation on the non-contrast CT. And the final finding is that this bone is more expanded as opposed to aggressively destroyed. And just one other point here, this is an MR. If we looked at this, we can say, wow, it looks pretty normal. But on the other hand, when we perform a CT scan, we can see that what we thought were aerated sinuses, especially in the sphenoid sinuses, was chock full of disease. And that disease, again, was high attenuation due to the allergic fungal sinusitis. 
Well, this is the bad one. This is the invasive fungal sinusitis. And this is mucormycosis and invasive aspergillosis. And the first stage of this disease, you really can't tell. You know, we can be here all day and look for an abnormality, but this looks like any type of polypoid mucosal thickening that we talked about before. But on the other hand, this finding was described about 20 years ago, or I should say 15 years ago. And these are the earliest findings of invasive fungal sinusitis. So really to add our value, and I'm going to show a few cases of invasive fungal sinusitis, in order for us to really make a difference, the take home is that we have to be familiar with the early findings of invasive fungal sinusitis. So if you have someone at high risk, the areas that you need to look for are in the soft tissues anterior to the wall of the maxillary sinus. This is called the canine fossa. And then the area posterior, we've talked about this already, the pterygopalatine fossa and the pterygomaxillary fissure. So look at the fat on the left-hand side. You see how there's nice crisp fat? These are the superficial muscles of facial expression. And posteriorly, we can see the fat involved in the pterygomaxillary fissure. But notice how the bone looks like it's intact, but you see all this grayness right here? That's actually extension of this disease through the bone through these emissary veins and into the soft tissues. If you can catch the disease at this point, you can really, really make a difference. Another example here, subtle finding, but this is located right in the pterygopalatine fossa. So if you have someone that's immunocompromised, that's had any type of kidney transplant, that's an uncontrolled diabetic, these are the patients at highest risk. And these are the areas that you really need to concentrate on. Just compare the fat on the right side with that on the left. Another example here, who sees where the abnormality is? Is the abnormality on the left side or the right side, first of all? Right side, good. On the right side, is the abnormality at A, B, or C? You got it. A, B, or C? See, it's a little bit more subtle here, but this is where the real abnormality is here. That's where you can make a difference, because this was invasive fungal sinusitis. Another example here, invasive fungal sinusitis is extending out into the soft tissues of the cheek. And again, look back here. See all this disease here involving the pterygomaxillary fissure? That's where you make a difference. So in this particular case, this is more advanced, right? I think everyone can make this diagnosis. Could this be a tumor? Absolutely. But if I tell you the patient was status post a kidney transplant, then we can make the, and he's very sick, we can make the diagnosis of invasive fungal sinusitis. So here's an example here. Disease here involving the pterygopalatine, or excuse me, pterygomaxillary fissure. Wasn't picked up, wasn't treated, the patient came back and then developed all of this erosion involving the anterior and posterior wall of the maxillary sinus. Then the disease extended superiorly into the pterygomaxillary, pterygomaxillary fissure and the pterygopalatine fossa. Once it gets into this area, again, well, I'm sorry, one more example here. Here's this disease involving the canine fossa. Later on, the same patient, everything is eroded, and now we start developing this disease in the masticator space. One more example, invasive fungal sinusitis extending back into the nasal cavity, erosion into the sphenoid sinus, erosion of the posterior wall of the maxillary sinus into the pterygopalatine fossa. This disease, that once it gets there, can extend laterally to involve the masticator space, as is seen here. And here's a coronal image involving the masticator space but it's also extending superiorly to involve the floor of the orbit and also involve the muscle. Once this disease gets up into the inferior portion of the orbit, it can extend into the cavernous sinus. And in this case, we can see abnormal enhancement involving the medial portion of the right temporal lobe. And in a different patient, this went on to form an intracranial brain abscess involving the temporal lobe. Now, this was a patient that still haunts me, still haunts me. Because this is, again, when I was at UNC, this was a patient that was uh, status post, I think, it was a, I think it was a kidney transplant. And we actually saw this diagnosis, and we made the diagnosis of invasive fungal sinusitis. So here we can see the enhancement of the sinus. And if you look closely, we see this enhancement of the mucosa, but look at the brain. This patient ended up having a cerebritis that were a result of the invasive fungal sinusitis. And I remember talking with the neurosurgeon. I tried to convince him to go back in and potentially resect that portion of the brain. But they opted not to. And unfortunately, this was the, uh, the autopsy. 
This patient ended up dying of this disease, and here we can see the burrowing in here of the frontal lobe. This is just all eaten away brain from the cerebritis. The other thing, too, is invasive fungal sinusitis can be angiophilic. Once it gets into the cavernous sinus, it can jump on the carotid artery. It can compress the carotid artery, and this patient developed a huge MCA infarct um, from the invasive fungal sinusitis as it literally just constricted the carotid artery. So that's why I emphasize in this specific disease, it's important to diagnose it early. If we can diagnose it early and know the early signs, we can make a difference. But to be honest with you, once it's already spread out into the soft tissues of the face, to be, we really can't do much. It becomes very, very difficult. The um, last thing that I'll talk about very briefly is radiation dose awareness. Now, <clears throat> and I know I'm preaching the choir on this, is I would, um, how many of you in the audience actually look at the dose, the DLP report from your sinuses? Got one? Right. Start looking at that, okay? Because, you know, uh, the thing that you don't want to happen is have radiology end up on the New York Times. And every seven years ago, every seven or eight years, now dose awareness is there. And we went through this massive thing when it was shown that uh, uh, David Brenner came out with the articles and says that uh, CT radiation dose can cause cancer. And I think it's a little bit debatable, cumulative dose and so on and so forth. But I think what it did do, it increased our awareness to actually look at the amount of dose that we're giving. So I would um, encourage you is that when you're looking at your CT of the sinuses, take a look at the DLP, the dose length product. Now, it's statute in the state of Michigan that each CT that we do has to have this dose length product recorded and sent to the PAC. So it is part of the patient record. If you're from California, this DLP actually goes in your report. In Michigan, it's not in our report, but it is on the images. So I would encourage you to look at this. And um, the best practice now, I would say, and it varies a little bit, but certainly anything over 500 right now for a DLP is way, way too high. So our DLPs um, here at, at MSU are probably around 100 to 200. So really, that's where it should be. In fact, you can even get it down lower than that, especially if you have um, some of the MBIR things. We use ACER here, but if you have some of the uh, MBIR type dose reduction, you can get it down to 80 or 90. The challenge is, is that it becomes a little bit grainy. But the take home message is, is start to look at these dose length products, because if you're not looking at it, eventually someone else will. And I would say, I don't know, Doug, what do you think it should be the sweet spot? Our sweet spot's between about 200 to 300. Is that what you all are? That's what, so I think that's the area where we should be. All right, so in summary, we talked about cysts versus polyps, sinusitis, mucosils. Remember the fungal sinus disease? It's hay fever, mycetomas, allergic fungal sinusitis, which is the diagnosis we can make, and also invasive fungal sinusitis, and look at the radiation dose awareness.